Sullivan again. Thank you so much for joining me for this lecture. This one is really near and dear to my heart as a psychologist. What we're going to talk about today is the psychology of aging with a specific focus on stress and how that is absolutely affecting the quality of your life and your brain health. I want to equip you with some new coping skills that are really going to reduce your everyday stress level and make you feel so much better. I want to remind you about what this I Care For Your Brain program is all about. I'm offering you evidence-based scientific information about the brain and telling you exactly what the scientific literature recommends that you do about it. I'm coming to you once a month in about an hour long lecture and the whole idea is to motivate you into action. So the learning topics for today are the stress response. You might have heard of that concept before but maybe aren't sure exactly what it means. We're gonna get really specific about the effects of stress on the overall body, but especially the brain. We're gonna talk about what are the stressors that are unique to older adults. So this is adults over the age of 50. I want to help you understand something very, very critical about stress, and that is the role that we play in how we interpret the things that happen to us. We're going to end by talking about some evidence-based coping strategies that I promise will have you feeling better in no time. Why is this topic important? Stress affects all of us. When I do my talks in lecture halls and I ask people in the audience to raise their hand if they feel that they have too much stress in their life, almost every single hand goes up. Too much stress and especially repeated stress, stress that does not let up, has serious consequences for our physical health, including the health of our brain. Stress in older adults in particular is associated with a decline in physical health, less satisfaction with life, and decreased overall quality of life. We all have coping skills, but until we know what the most productive ones are, we might actually be doing coping skills that are hurting us. Coping skills can either be considered helpful or harmful. If you don't know the right ways to be helping yourself with stress, you could actually be doing yourself more harm than good, even though you think you're trying to cope with a stressor. There are things that you can do today to start to learn how to respond better to stress. For the last two years, the American Psychological Association has put out the stress survey. And what they do is they ask Americans, how stressed out are you on a scale of zero to 10? Zero being no stress at all, 10 being the most stressed out you can possibly imagine. 25% of people in these studies reported a stress level of eight or higher, and 50% reported that they average between a four and a seven. Because stress is so common over time, the body has developed a really exquisite response system to a stressor in the environment. This is what's called the stress response, and it's basically a physiological cascade of events that allows us to be available at a moment's notice to act at our physical and mental peak. What essentially happens when our brain perceives a stressor or a threat is that all of the blood in the body rushes to the vital organs in the center of the body. You might have noticed that when you have anxiety or high stress, your fingers can get a little bit tingly, feel a little bit numb. This is related to the blood going right to your viscera. So that way, if you had to book it away from a tiger, you would have the ability to do so. The other thing that happens is the blood that's in our brain rushes to that core called the subcortical area. If you were with us a few lectures ago, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is more of the primitive part of the brain that isn't so much about reasoning and judgment. It's really about split second action and emotions. The reason why we do this is because we need to be really, really quick on our toes and in our thinking to respond in the safest way possible. But the key is that the stress response is only designed to happen in short bursts. But remember, most of us are between a four and a 10 on the stress scale. So the question becomes, what happens to us physically and emotionally when we are constantly stuck in a stress response. So what exactly is the process of the stress response? The first thing that happens is an emotional part of the brain called the amygdala. If the amygdala decides that what's going on is indeed a threat, this starts a process in the body of stress hormones being released. This cascade of brain chemicals sets up a communication pattern between another part of the brain called the hypothalamus. 
In the hypothalamus, a lot of our basic bodily functions are regulated. So what starts to happen next is that blood flow change, where it all starts to go to the core. This also increases our blood pressure and the amount of blood sugar that we have in our body in order to access that fight or flight response. I'm sure you've heard of the fight or flight response. It basically means you're either going to get out of the way of harm or you're going to face the harm directly. The idea is that once the stressor has passed, the body can go back and reset itself to get back to baseline. The problem becomes when we never really get unstressed and we never really get back to baseline. The body was not designed to handle a consistent influx of these stress hormones. Let's just talk about the feelings that happen when stress is repeated or constant. I think the first thing that happens is people feel very overwhelmed. They can feel irritable. They can feel like even a little stressor becomes a very big stressor. This is the whole idea of making mountains out of molehills. We can have trouble falling asleep. We're decreased in our appetite and we generally are just off. There's something called the American Institute on Stress. Yep, that's right. It's such a problem for us Americans that we needed our own institute to figure out what to do about it. And there's a measure that they like to use called the stress inventory. If you look in the companion workbook, you're actually going to see how to calculate your own personal stress score. And what they've done is they've taken different life events. Now, some are somewhat positive and some are somewhat negative and some are neutral. But the idea is that every life event carries with it a certain amount of stress. Now don't make the mistake that only negative things are stressful. That's actually not true. Moving can be very exciting, but it can also be very stressful. Getting married, in fact, is in one of the top five stressful life events. The idea is you look through this inventory, you can tally up your own personal number of stressful life events, let's say over the last six months. When you figure out your number, it calculates for you the likelihood of you becoming sick in that given period of time. For example, a score over 300 puts you at very high risk for an illness. A score of 150 to 299 puts you at moderate risk. And a score of under 150 predicts only a slight degree of illness within that time period. Chronic exposure to stress hormones affects us on every level of well being and health, from physical to cognitive and mental. Let's talk about those three effects. When I think of the physical effects of chronic stress, the first thing that comes to my mind is fatigue. This is probably related to a few different things. One is that chronic muscle tension, really feeling like you carry the weight of the world on your shoulders, being so tense. That takes a lot of energy for your body. And if you never release that level of stress, you're literally carrying a load around with you all day. People who are chronically stressed are notoriously poor sleepers. Part of this is probably due to anxiety. We all know that things that happen during the day seem one way, but when we put our head down on the pillow at night, they can seem so much larger and so much more threatening. So many times there's not the ability within ourselves to relax to the point where we can actually fall asleep. The other thing is that stress hormones are very activating. That's their whole job. Their job is to get us up and running if we need to, to get us fighting if that's what we need to do. So once they're circulating around in the bloodstream, it's very, very hard for our body to come down on its own. And as we all know, you have to be relaxed in order to fall into a deep state of sleep. Now, while we sleep, many amazing things are happening. And I really hope that you join me for the whole lecture on sleep because it's a fascinating subject. But briefly, as it relates to stress, let me just say a few things. The first thing I want you to know is that our immune system is the most active when we sleep at night. This is why if you think of yourself having a flu, all you wanna do is sleep. It's because the body is so smart. It wants to put all of the non-essential functions to bed, literally, in order to focus on getting out those very important disease-fighting cells all throughout your bloodstream. Now, this is critical to things like dementia because we used to think that the immune system basically cut off at the blood-brain barrier. 
Well, recently, due to some amazing advances in neuroimaging, we know that the brain actually has its own system of immunity, living all within itself with very specialized skills that specifically get into the brain and take away things that shouldn't be there, like the buildup of plaques and tangles associated with Alzheimer's disease. The other way that stress and sleep really go hand in hand is that when we sleep, one of the functions that our brain is doing is emotional processing. This is where we compare notes of what happened to us during the day versus what did we expect to happen and the whole rest of our life history, especially emotionally laden material. If you never get the chance to fall into a deep sleep because your body is so hyped up on stress hormones, you're never going to really move through emotional experiences, especially those that might be more traumatic in nature. Every night you go to sleep and you get a good night's sleep, it's basically free therapy. I really want you to look at it that way. So when we're stressed out and we can never fully give ourselves over to sleep, we're not getting that benefit. Research studies also show us that people that are chronically stressed have a much higher incidence of cardiovascular disease like hypertension, high cholesterol, and type 2 diabetes. There's a really interesting line of research that's being done at the VAs right now across the country that's showing that veterans who have post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a, of course, stress-related disorder, are at risk for rapid aging. And they basically think this is because there's too many stress hormones circulating in the body. The body is not meant to be constantly under watch and wondering what threats it needs to be on the lookout for. So it's critically important for your physical health to make sure that you keep your stress levels in check. The next thing I wanna talk about is the effects on mental health of too much stress. We've all had times in our lives where we just feel like the stress is relentless and it just keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps coming. Part of that is the more stressed out you are, the less coping skills you have to deal with stress. <laughs> the more tired you are, the more tense you are. So it really is a negative snowball that keeps going and going and going. People that are chronically stressed have a harder time paying attention. They're definitely more tired and that makes us more inattentive, very hard to sustain our interest and our motivation on a specific topic over time. We're gonna talk a lot about this in the future when we get to memory, but attention is absolutely the bridge that gets you to memory. Improving your attention is one of those secrets that brain scientists know really helps to improve memory. People who are chronically stressed have much higher levels of depression and anxiety than people that aren't, and that probably has to do with that additive nature of stress over time. People who are chronically stressed don't want to be chronically stressed. They don't want to feel that bad. So what they tend to do is adopt other behaviors to compensate, like overeating, drinking too much alcohol, feeling like they don't have enough energy to get out and exercise. We all know once you're on that couch, it's very hard to reverse the, the course of the day and get out there and do things that are more healthful. One thing that's really important for you to know are the consequences of chronic stress on the brain. So now you know all about stress hormones, right? Specifically cortisol. Cortisol is a very toxic substance in the brain, specifically to the memory centers in the brain called the hippocampus. There's been a lot of really good research studies showing that people who've been exposed to traumatic stressors, particularly over and over and over again, have changes in the size of the memory centers in their brain. If we wanna understand this on an even closer level, the microscopic level, what we want to think about is how neurons or brain cells specifically are affected by chronic stress. And I want you to look at this picture here. The picture on the left shows a really healthy brain cell. Notice all the branches that it has. Those are called dendrites. And those are the little communicators that reach out to other brain cells and exchange information back and forth. The neuron on the right is taken from an animal model from a mouse. And this is an unfortunate animal who lived in a very, very stressful environment. They sacrifice the animals after the study, they look at their brains under a microscope, and what they see is it's not that they lost brain cells. So it's not that chronic stress 
kills brain cells, but what it does is it dramatically reduces those little connectors, those dendrites, the communicators that interface with all the other brain cells. In the animal model, this seems to happen most critically in the hippocampus, which are those memory centers, and the prefrontal cortex. This is the part of our brain that's responsible for reasoning. Remember how I said before that all the blood in the body goes to the heart and all the blood in the brain goes to that middle part of the brain? This sets us up for something very dangerous. This is called the emotional hijack. And you need to know about this because you should not be making important decisions when you are under a lot of stress. And I wanna to explain to you exactly why that is. When the blood rushes to that middle part of your brain, those primitive emotional centers, it does a great job of figuring out what is a threat and what is not a threat. But what happens is you don't have nearly as much access to the reasoning part of your brain, the part of your brain that can weigh risks and consequences, the part of your brain that can think two days down the road and think, okay, if I say that to my boss, I'm probably gonna be embarrassed to go to work Monday, might even get fired right? So you really need to understand that you're literally at a cognitive disadvantage for problem solving your way through stressors when you're in the immediate throes of a stress response. So let's talk about how stress uniquely affects the older adult. So here's the good news, is that when you break down the generations by things like Gen X, baby boomers, matures, and the millennials, older adults consistently fall amongst the least stressed of these groups. And interestingly, millennials always check out to be the most stressed. Now, I think we could talk for a long time about why that is, and I have my own ideas, but because we're focused on the older adult, we're just gonna keep it to that. Now, that being said, there are some stressors that are unique to the older adult, and I wanna go through some of these with you because I think it's really important that we understand how stress affects you or someone that you care about uniquely. When you ask older adults what is it that they're stressed out about, the number one thing that they tell us is slowing down. That it's really hard to not be able to do the things that you used to do. When you're an able-bodied person, when your brain is working great, it's very easy to take this for granted. And sometimes it's only when we can't do the things that make us feel like us, that we really notice how important those things were. The second thing that affects older adults uniquely is that it looks like from the research that they are very concerned about the state of the world. And I think this might have to do with the fact that they've lived through some very significant world events, specifically World War II, Vietnam. They've lived through depressions. They've lived through seeing people have not enough food to eat. And when they see us getting back involved with international conflict, when they're worried that maybe politics is going down the tubes, I think that it really affects older adults in a specific way. The next thing is so many losses in a very short amount of time. Those of us who are younger, I don't think we have any idea how it feels to lose so many people special to us in a really short amount of time. Sometimes I'll check in with my patients and ask them how they've been doing, and they'll tell me that they've been to three funerals that week. And you know this just as well as I do, we are not very well equipped as a culture to talk about and process death. One of the most exciting things happening in clinical care and medicine right now is that doctors are actually being trained to talk to older adults about the concept of death. A few of the other things on the list are chronic pain. Many, many older adults have osteoarthritis and the aches and pains of getting older can be very distressing and very distracting. It's hard to sometimes focus on the things that matter to you, like reading, getting out, being with your friends, and exercising when your body just hurts. As we get older, a very normal psychological response is to look back on our lives in a process we call life review, and we make some very general conclusions. Was my life satisfactory to me? Did I do what I really wanted to do? Did I follow my dreams? Did I leave a legacy? Was I good to people? Is what I did for my life's work meaningful to other people? The psychologist Eric Erickson wrote volumes about this, that when older adults come to the conclusion that they're not basically satisfied with their life, this increases mental health distress dramatically. 50 to 70% of all primary care visits for older adults 
are related to stress-related conditions. The whole concept of the mind-body connection is that you can't separate physical and mental health. They're absolutely reciprocal with one affecting the other. One model of chronic stress used in the aging literature are caregivers. As a group, we know that these are some of the most stressed people in the older adult population. Not only do they have to deal with their own process, but they're now asked to be in charge of someone else, physically and mentally sometimes. They need to make decisions on the behalf of someone else that used to be able to manage all of these things independently. Caregivers have a much higher rate of physical stress, including higher mortality. They're more often sick. They're more often depressed and anxious. And part of this, we think as scientists, is that there's not a lot of support for the aging process. In a four-year longitudinal study, older adults who were caregivers had a 63% chance of dying earlier than their counterparts who were not caregivers. The cause for all of this is thought to be due to that immune system problem that we talked about before, that when you're chronically under stress, your immune system can just not fight normal disease and infection. The strain of being a caregiver is thought to cut across all fields of well-being, financial, spiritual, physical. Alongside that, there's very often a grieving process that's going on, specifically when it comes to brain disorders like dementia. But the person is typically so busy caring for that other person that they don't have time to do their own grieving process, and that's when the stress can really pile up and become chronic. So I want to talk to you about a really important psychological step in the chronic stress puzzle. So remember before I was telling you about this concept of appraisal. So let's talk about this in detail. It, it, it's going to take a shift in your thinking. So the first thing I need you to get on board with is that when things happen to us and we interpret them, that interpretation is not necessarily true. There's a little space between a stressor and our response to it. And it's in that little special space that we are in a split second making our judgments about how threatening that stressor truly is and what are our resources for dealing with it. Most of the time, stress comes about because we feel that the threat is larger than it really is and that our resources for dealing with the stressor are actually less than they really are. So let me give you a couple examples of appraisal because we all do it all the time. It falls under an even bigger category of the psychology of coping called cognitive distortions. And the whole idea is that we have a filter or a lens that we use to interpret reality. Here's a perfect example. There is a cognitive distortion called mind reading that we really think deep down that we know someone else's intentions. Many stressors, many hurt feelings come back to this whole idea of mind reading. If someone slights us in some way, if we think they give us a dirty look or they don't include us, we immediately interpret it that there was something wrong with us. Where the truth is, the pure objective reality may be that it wasn't about us at all. So part of teaching you about appraisal is I really want you to slow down and start to recognize when you're making these interpretive leaps. So in that small gap where you're appraising, the first thing that happens is you make a judgment. You are either going to see that stressor as a challenge or as a threat. When you view it as a challenge, what happens is that you see the potential for growth. What happens when you see it as a threat is you immediately go into the stress response and you have to determine how strong of a threat is this stressor really? Is it a low threat or is it a high threat? Now over time, the brain has developed some amazing mechanisms for survival. And one of them is that we all pay more attention to threatening stimuli than we do to neutral. That is just part of human nature. But the thing is, when we have anxiety, or maybe we're depressed, or we've been through a really stressful life event, we actually do see things as more negative than they really are in reality. So what we do is we interpret neutral information, information that is truly neither good or bad, in conjunction with our mood. So if we're in a bad mood, we're much more likely to interpret something as negative and threatening. 
Whereas we're in a good mood and we're in a low stress mood, we're much more likely to be able to be more realistic about the level of threat that is posed. Now here's some interesting things about stress. The more interpersonal the stressor and the more uncontrollable the stressor, the more trauma that it carries. So a perfect example of this are car accidents. You might think that if you got hit you might think that if you got hit head on in a car accident, that that would be the most traumatic thing. But what science actually tells us, it's the people that are hit from behind that tend to be more psychologically damaged. And the whole idea is they didn't see it coming. It just doesn't make sense with our ideas of how the world is supposed to work. In addition, when a stressor is related to a person or specifically a person who was in a position where they were supposed to look out after us, where they were trusted, where they break some of those codes, that is very stressful to us. And this is related to what psychologists call schema therapy. The idea that we're all walking around with these schemas in our mind. And schema just means our thoughts, our interpretations of the way the world is supposed to work. So for example, we're all walking around thinking, the world's basically a good place, good things happen to good people. So what happens if something very traumatic happens to you? It's not going to fit within that schema, that idea that you once had. So what people typically do is they have to alter their beliefs somewhat, and people typically make themselves the fall guy, and they'll decide that they must have done something bad to incur this stressful experience. So let's talk about coping skills. There's really two types of coping skills. Ones that bring you closer to the problem, giving you the chance to solve it, and ones that pull you away from the problem, which help you avoid it. Most of us are pretty amazing avoiders. If we don't have to think about something, we've got some great abilities to just put it in the back of our minds and not think about it for a pretty long time. The problem is it always comes back. Now I want you to understand the difference between these two coping skills because one, the avoidance behaviors are really pretty bad, pretty unhealthy in the long term. You might think short term you're getting away with something, but like I said, it always comes back. Whereas the approach coping skills where you actually go towards the problem, figure it out and do your best are what are gonna help you keep that chronic stress feeling away. So what exactly are these avoidance behaviors? It's when we do things like, I'm not gonna think about that, please don't talk about that, I don't wanna remember that. Basically we're shoving it into a little box somewhere and we think the idea is we're never gonna have to revisit it again. Other forms of avoidance are social withdrawal, becoming emotionally numb, just feeling like we don't wanna be around people at all because if we're not around people, then we're never gonna to have to process some of the deeper issues that we might have related to our relationships. Escapism is a big one for avoidance. That's when we can get lost in our hobbies, lost in our minds, lost in our imagination. Now, of course, some of that is great. Some of that is really, really healthy. But the problem is, is that when people turn to that over and over again and start to withdraw a little bit from the social world. And the last avoidance behavior that you need to know about is resignation. This is basically throwing up your arms and saying, nothing I can do about it, it is what it is. Really, that's a very low level way of coping because you're never really making any progress. You're just simply staying in place. So let's talk about these more healthy coping skills, the idea of actually approaching the problem. What these coping skills involve are things that help you focus on what you can actually change, the things that you actually have control over. So the idea is that you're actually seeking information. You are seeking clarification. You are not mind reading. You are not imagining that you know exactly what people mean. You're simply finding that sweet spot of assertiveness to ask, I'm not sure what you meant by that. Can you please help me understand? We have a lot of social pressure, I think particularly as women, maybe even more so as older women, to avoid conflict at all costs, to not be seen as the aggressor, to not be the B word. But what we're hopefully developing as a culture 
is that assertiveness is actually okay. It's okay to have boundaries for ourselves in terms of other people's behavior. We have a right to be respected, but we also have to give that respect to other people. Two big approach coping skills are planning and figuring out what is it you can actually do. Sometimes it's very hard to figure out what that is, and you might need to talk over a problem with a trusted friend to figure out, okay, what is my actual responsibility here? But the main difference between these two things is are you going towards the problem to fix it or are you running away from the problem? When you run away from the problems time and time again, that's when we get into this chronically stressed mode and our brain and our body and our mental health suffer the consequences. Now, what about the coping skills of older adults specifically? Older adults historically have pretty good coping skills that they've had to develop over a lifetime of stressful events. The more and more you've been through something, you do typically do better. One of the things I'm hoping changes in the next few years as people become more empowered with information about their mental, physical, and cognitive health is that older adults will feel more and more comfortable with talking with mental health professionals. Research as early as this year still continues to show that older adults on the whole think that participating in therapy or counseling is a sign of weakness. This is further exacerbated by the shortage that we have in the whole world of providers who are uniquely trained in geriatrics. For many people, they don't have doctors within their community that specialize in the unique needs of older adults. One big difference between younger adults and older adults is their reliance on their spiritual or religious beliefs to help them cope with life events. Older adults tend to spend more time praying and attending church services than younger adults. One important form of coping reported by over half the older adults polled is spiritual beliefs, prayer, attending spiritual services. When we think about how older adults are interpreting stressors, what we know is that there are differences in the content of what the stressor represents. Health-related stressors are interpreted more negatively by older adults on the whole, whereas financial stressors are viewed as more of a challenge and they tend to take more of a problem-solving approach. Interpersonal events are viewed by older adults typically as the least challenging of all the stressors. But the one exception is when there's a high degree of conflict involved. And what older adults tend to do on average is to retreat back into avoidance behaviors. Now this might be one example though when avoidance is not necessarily all bad. What I hope happens to me as I get older is that I have the wisdom to know people that I'm able to work out conflicts with versus people that no matter what I say and do, they might not be interested in a resolution. And I think that that happens as we get older, we have more and more experience with different types of people, and sometimes we just know to leave it alone. The more chronically stressed older adults are, the more they tend to be depressed and turn to alcohol as a form of coping. These are all reasons why we need to get serious about stress and its effect on our health. So let's transition into our recommendations. The first recommendation that I have for you is known as know thyself. You need to know how it is that you personally respond to stress. Are you an avoider or are you an approacher? If you go into the companion workbook, there's gonna be some great tools in there for helping you figure out how exactly is it that you uniquely process stressful life events. The next step is I want you to really think about that concept of appraisals. I want you to slow down the next time something stressful happens to you, and I want you to pay attention to the label that you give the experience. Do you see it as a challenge or do you see it as a threat? When a stressful thing happens to you, how capable do you really believe you are at handling that stressor? The bottom line of this recommendation is that you have to figure out what it is that you are bringing to each stressful experience. Then I want you to ask yourself, are you perceiving the stressor accurately. Remember, there's a lot of interpretation that goes on. A stressor happens and we have a response. In between is that appraisal and it's your responsibility to figure out if you have interpreted reality correctly. So when in doubt, 
go to the person and seek respectful clarification. I want you to view the next stressor that happens to you as a challenge instead of a threat. I want you to use words like, I think that this is something that's challenging me. I don't feel threatened by this. I know that I can handle this. And I guarantee you that just that shift in your language and in your beliefs is really going to help you feel that you're much more in charge thereby your stress levels are going to go down. Remember when I told you about the emotional hijack? This is critical. We have to wait to respond when we are under stress. We're not going to do ourselves or the people in our lives any service by trying to solve the problem immediately. I promise you that you will think about the stressor in a more reasoned and balanced way if you just afford yourself the time to truly think about it. Remember in the emotional hijack, what happens is that all of that blood in the brain is going right to the emotional core and you're just running on pure adrenaline and cortisol. You are literally not biologically in touch with the part of your brain that will help you hold back and give your best response. So give yourself the gift of time and don't feel the pressure to respond to stressful things immediately. The next thing is do not be an ostrich. You do not want to be an an avoider. You want to be someone that sees these challenges as something that you are able to handle. Remember that avoidance just leads to more and more anxiety. And what happens is even though we might think at first we're successfully pushing down something, it always pops up in another place. If you've ever seen that game whack-a-mole, it's kind of that same idea. You think you've pushed it down over here, but actually it's popping up over here. That is the way the human psyche works. There's no way to push it down completely. It's always gonna pop up somewhere else. It's really important to simply acknowledge your feelings without rushing to change them. We all suffer from not being comfortable with the so-called negative emotions. What I mean by that is anger, jealousy, greed, we feel very uncomfortable when we have those emotions and many of us reach for unhealthy coping skills to try to change the way we feel immediately. This is where the misuse of alcohol can come in, is we're not comfortable sitting with these feelings and we don't like the way it makes us feel. So we wanna change our physiology to temporarily make us feel better. The most important thing with stress is that you believe that you can find a solution. Now the solution is probably going to be something that doesn't work for everyone. And this is critical to get your stress levels down. Many of us are people pleasers. Again, I'm talking to the women out here. We are very socialized to make nice, to be good, to help other people. And it's really, really important that we afford ourselves that same level of respect. And also please remember, and so this too shall pass. When you first hear about a very stressful life event, it's normal that you're gonna have a big rush, a big peak of stress and anxiety. But just remember that over time, you're gonna get some distance. You're gonna think about it in a little bit of a different way. Your social network is gonna support you and help you. It will not feel the same tomorrow as it feels today. I really wanna encourage you to find the sweet spot of communication for yourself. This is one of my favorite psychology concepts. The idea is that we've got two ends on the communication spectrum. One end is passive communication. And on the far other end, we have aggressive communication. When we're passive and we don't say anything, we don't stick up for ourselves, we don't say the things that are bothering us, what we're doing is affording the other person all of the respect. What happens over time is that it builds and it builds and it builds and eventually we blow and that's when we can be aggressive. And what we're doing when we're aggressive is taking all of the respect for ourselves. And what I want you to find is that sweet spot in the middle that's called assertiveness. The idea here is that you demand respect and you give respect. You're not purposefully hurting other people, but you're also not gonna put yourself in the position of being hurt. So some tips for getting there, after many, many years of pressure to be nice, don't say anything, don't hurt anyone else's feelings, are in your companion workbook. I wanna go through a couple of these with you right now. So I want you to repeat after me. I am just not comfortable with that. 
Let me think about that some. I don't have an answer for you right now. No thanks, I just really don't have the time to do that right now. I don't appreciate it when you talk to me like that, so please stop. I really respect your opinion, but I also want you to respect mine. One of the biggest forms of stress for all of us is other people demanding things of us that we don't really want to give or to do. So having boundaries on your time and on your energy is absolutely essential to keeping chronic stress down. It's really important with stress to feel like you can find the benefit, the silver lining, so to speak. About 50% of older adults who were polled in one study felt that they actually derive some benefit from even the most serious of health concerns, financial ruin, and interpersonal stress like the death of a spouse. Finding the benefit is a very important way of making meaning out of stressful life events and not feeling that they happen to you at random and for no reason at all. So after every stressful event, I want you to take some time to think about what did I learn? What will I do different next time that I wasn't prepared for this time? Remember at the beginning of our lecture, I was teaching you about how once you're stressed out, you're less equipped to deal with the next stressor. Well, there's something called stress prevention. And the whole idea is to put yourself in the best physical and mental shape that you can possibly be to handle stressors. So let's just talk about three basic things that you can do to build up your resistance to stress. The first one is prioritizing sleep. Now, yes, sleep changes as we get older, and we're gonna get into that. But what I want you to know is that every person needs at least six to seven hours of uninterrupted sleep at night to handle the stresses of everyday life. If your sleep is interrupted more than one or two times per night, especially if you have a hard time falling back asleep and that lasts for a half hour or an hour, your sleep is disrupted and we need to figure out what's going on because sleep is just that important to your physical health, to your mental health, and to your brain's health. The next form of stress prevention is to make sure that you're getting exercise on a regular basis. This is a theme you're gonna hear me say time and time again, and that's because when you start to look in the scientific journals, so many different aspects of brain health can be assisted with cardiovascular exercise, but it's really, really good for helping you deal with the little stressors in life all the way up to big traumatic events. And the last one is to practice gratitude. This is a phrase that we hear thrown around quite a bit nowadays, but the idea is to actually do it and to put it into practice in your everyday life. So what does it mean? It means being grateful for the things that you have. There was a psychologist named Dr. Maslow, who's pretty famous, and he came out with one of the best concepts that was ever conceived of in psychology, in my opinion, something called the hierarchy of needs. And I wanna talk to you a little bit about it right now because it really relates to this concept of gratitude. I want you to think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs as a pyramid. And the idea is that you have to have your needs met on different levels before you can rise to the next level. So let me break that down a little bit. So why this concept feels really important to me in this discussion is that you can't have your needs met at a higher level than you currently are. So at the very top of this pyramid is something like self-actualization. This is a psychological term that basically means you are living your dreams, you are living your best life. Every day you're engaged with activities that make you feel like the best, most unique you. But you can't do that until you've got the other lesser levels of life satisfaction under your belt. So the first thing that we have to think about are just basic physiological needs, eating, sleeping, clothing, shelter. Once you have that under your belt, you can move up to the next level, which is safety. This goes for both physical health and mental health. Once you have that under your belt, then you can start to focus on things like love and belonging, being part of a social group. Once you graduate from there, you can actually start to build true self-esteem, feeling that you are a valuable person who brings unique gifts into the world. From there, then you can hit that self-actualization. 
I think a lot of people's stress comes from the fact that the idea that we have about our life, about happiness, is that we should be hitting the top of the pyramid every day, being our best selves, bringing our unique selves to the world. But really, if we look at our lives, we're struggling with some of those layers underneath. So what I want you to do is look at this hierarchy of need and really figure out where is it that you are living right now and start to work on that level. How this ties into gratitude is I want you to think about everything that you have that allows you to think about that level and be grateful for it. So, you know, sometimes all of us fall into the trap of complaining about being bored. But really the truth is we're able to have those feelings because we have a home and because we have water and we have food. So it's just important sometimes to get back to the basics and be grateful for what it is that we have, not necessarily always striving for the next thing. The final recommendation is I really want you to take serious the idea of getting professional help if you feel like you or someone that you care about needs it. 33% of people who would benefit from counseling say that they would never ever bring it up with their doctors or their medical providers. We have to change this. Mental health is just as important as physical health, but if we don't bring it to the people that are in charge of taking care of us, we're going to keep suffering. And that's a responsibility that both us as your doctors and you as the person who's experiencing it are responsible to change. So I'm trying to do my part and I encourage you to try to do your part. Bring up your level of stress, bring up your anxiety if you're having it to your primary care doctor. It really is their job to take care of the whole person, not just your physical self. There are different types of mental health professionals ranging from psychologists to social workers to clergy to counselors. And I'm just gonna briefly talk to you about some of their techniques. I really believe that if you understand the techniques and we can demystify what counseling or therapy means, you might be more likely to approach it. The first thing is something called cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is so related to our talk today because what a cognitive therapist is trying to get you to understand is that the way you are thinking about a problem is part of the problem. And their job is to try to respectfully help you change your perception. So they use a talk therapy in which they go back and forth and try to help you understand maybe you're not quite seeing this accurately. And there can be so much freedom in that because you've assumed that there's a level of truth to what it is you perceive. And when you can be freed from feeling like you're responsible for other people's feelings, that it's your fault that things aren't working out, it's incredibly liberating. The next thing that counselors help us with is relaxation training. This is so relevant to our talk today. So much of how we experience stress happens in the body. Remember that fight or flight response, that stress response? We are carrying enormous amounts of tension in our muscles. Those stress hormones are keeping us fatigued and we need to know how to calm our nervous system. Many of us are not taught these techniques until we go into a therapy that focuses on it. Once you feel more in charge of your body and you know all on your own how to bring yourself down from a stressful state, it feels so good. The final approach to therapy is supportive therapy. This is where someone's there to give you a safe, respectful place to express your feelings, to validate that what you're feeling is okay. It's really important for us to recognize and accept that we have a right to our feelings. If you've not had anyone in your life before that allows you to truly express yourself and validates your emotions, it can feel wonderful to get that level of support. And when talk therapy doesn't work or when symptoms just feel kind of hardwired, some of us had parents that were very anxious, maybe there's some clinical depression in your family, that's where medications come in. And those are prescribed by medical providers like a psychiatrist or a psychiatric nurse practitioner, and they can help with the brain chemistry that might be contributing to the feelings of ongoing stress and anxiety. So I hope that some of these recommendations help you. It's so important that we learn to cope better with stress because let's face it, life is really stressful, but we do not want to suffer the consequences. Thank you so much for joining me and I can't wait to see you again.